open the meeting. Uh, welcome colleagues and obviously we've got visitors today who are here to witness what we're doing. So welcome to everybody who's here. Um, um, there are no apologies being received. Agenda item one is declaration of interests. And obviously we welcome Duncan McNeil to the committee and invite Duncan to, the, to tell us whether he wants to take care of any relevant interests or otherwise. I've got no um, interests other than the, the interests expressed in my public declaration, Camino. I'm grateful to you, Duncan. Uh, and obviously, uh, with Duncan arriving, Drew Smith's no longer on the committee, but I'd just like to thank Drew for his thoughtful and considered contributions in his time when he was a member of the committee. Um, agenda item number two. It's been indicated um, to me by the clerks that the Labour Party have decided to change their nominee for Deputy Convener of the Committee and that Lewis MacDonald is to be replaced by Duncan McNeill. I invite the committee, therefore, to agree that Duncan McNeill becomes the Deputy Convener and welcome, to him that, uh, welcome him to that role and ob obviously also thank Lewis. Lewis was very good at prodding me when I was going in the, right, the wrong direction. I hope Duncan can do the same. Um, so thank you very much, Lewis, for your time uh, in that capacity. Um, we are, and at that, I'm going to ask for a short suspension until the witnesses are able to, to join us of the, of the committee. Thank you very much. case, I'll formally open the, the meeting again and ask everyone to make sure that their telephones are switched off. And I just heard one going off as I said it, so I'm glad I made that reminder. Um, very warm welcome to the witnesses to the committee this morning. Um, I've, I'm going to just go through who you are. I don't have them in the same order as you're sitting, so forgive me. It would be too complicated for me to try to work it out any other way, so I'll just go what I've got here. Uh, Peter Kelly, we have the Director from the Poverty Alliance, Dave Moxham, the Deputy General Secretary of the STUC, Lucy McTernan, the Deputy Chief Executive of SCVO, Satwa Riemann, the Director of One Parent Family Scotland, uh, Bill Scott, the Director of Policy Inclusion Scotland, and Mary Taylor, the Chief Executive and Scottish Federation of Housing Associations. There are still phones going off here somewhere, but I hope that's now stopped. Good morning, everybody. Um, this is quite a big panel we have here today, so I'm going to ask my colleagues, MSPs, to be as succinct as they can with their questions. And obviously, if we can do the same with our answers, that would be helpful. Uh, I, 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 we'll ask probably general questions of the, the panel. Um, there may be occasions when there's a particular question directed at you, but if the general question you feel you want to answer, please do. And if you want to contribute, just catch my eye. We'll try to make that happen in terms of a... So, since it's a big panel, we need to try to be a bit less, in, bit less formal in the way we go about this in a normal committee, otherwise we'll not get through everything we want to get through. I'm going to chunk it down in three sort of ways. I'll probably deal with welfare powers, 
taxpayers, and I'll try to pull all the other issues together um, as a package towards the, the end of the, this morning's discussion. Um, with that being said, um, can I just open with a very general question to you all to, 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 to get a reaction? And I'd like to begin with a question about content and cohesion uh, of the Smithkin Commission's proposals um, and to what extent they will effectively address the interests of the groups you represent. It's a very general question. I allow you to deal with the, the opening in a way you feel you wish to do. So, I'd like to kick off. Lucy looks as though she's ready to go. <laughs> Well, good morning, uh, everyone, and thanks very much for, for having us all along to have this, this discussion this morning. Um, the, th the first thing I'd like to say on, on behalf of, of the voluntary sector um, is that um, we engaged with the Smith Commission with um, great enthusiasm. It was very an in, in, a very intense period of work. Um, the voluntary sector had a lot to say on all the subjects that, that have eventually emerged in, in the Smith Commission report. Um, but I think we would like, for the record, we've been open about it in, in the public press and elsewhere, say that we found doing th this kind of work in that very intense, uh, very quick uh, way really quite frustrating. It didn't enable us to engage with the people that we, we represent and involve in the thorough way that we would like. Um, and while everybody did, as I say, engage um, very thoroughly and, and with a lot of enthusiasm because it is such an important set of issues, um, I think we need on an ongoing basis to create the space for this kind of discussion about what is appropriate governance um, for Scotland, for Scottish society, um, for, for people wherever they are in, in whichever communities. Um, it's a new type of, of, of politics that, that we're seeking. And I think if, you, if the general question is about content, then I think it's important that, that, that we make that point. In terms of uh, the conclusions that the Commission uh, arrived at and the content of the report, um, I think the, the, the summary would be that we are uh, happy with some elements, um, not happy with others, where um, the, the things that the, the voluntary sector called for uh, have not been addressed, not even mentioned in some cases. Um, but the key issue uh, around uh, welfare, I think, and I'm sure colleagues here will, will, will talk more about this as, as we progress through the morning, is about the issue of coherence and whether the, the things that are detailed in the report um, actually do have the correct um, dividing line, whether it is possible, given the interconnectedness of the full range of benefits that, 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 that people um, can, can access, um, makes sense in a way that can be supported and delivered in practice. Um, and so there is work yet to be done, which we in the third sector would very much like to be involved in. We don't think this is just a, a politician to politician or official to fish, official type engagement. It's something that we have expertise about how um, these kinds of issues will affect people in practice, and we would like to, to be involved in it. And then a third sort of bundle of issues would be about the, those things where um, uh, the Smith Commission has suggested that, that further power should be devolved. And I think we have a key interest in ensuring that, that where that is appropriate, that that is expedited. Uh, a very key example for us in the third sector would be around employability as part of the package of, uh, of welfare um, uh, services. Um, we know that the work programme is not delivering for people in, in Scotland. It's not delivering for people across the rest of the UK either. And, in our opinion, but we know that um, the kinds of programmes and uh, uh, projects and activities that the third sector delivers and supports in Scotland really does work, uh, really does help people. The statistics prove it, um, particularly those that you might call the furthest away from the la labour market or have been called the hardest to help. We do help and we do get into to productive uh, employment and we would like to see work done uh, as soon as possible to ensure that the, the resources can be transferred um, f uh, to, to um, the kinds of activities that, that we undertake um, to make um, that kind of work happen uh, as quickly as possible. So that would be my, my three, you, three main areas. Uh, thank, you for, thank you for the opening. That's quite a broad opening you provided. Is there anybody to add anything new into that? Dave, I think you wanted to... Yeah, I mean, just, just specifically, I suppose, and I suppose apologies for starting with the negative, the, the biggest concern for the STUC was that the range of powers that might impact the labour market and the quality of, of, of work, um, employment law and other areas weren't included in the, in the proposals for devolution. I won't talk about that for too long because in a sense that's uh, a ship that, that seems to have sailed, but that was one of our major concerns. I think we did welcome the increase in tax 
uh, powers, we would have gone further. Um, I think the big question now for, for what happens next is how the financial framework is, um, is, is written up so that those new tax powers and those new spending powers can be exercised in a way that properly incentivises government action um, in Scotland and doesn't, in a sense, um, uh, rob Peter to pay Paul. I'm happy to go into that in more detail when we discuss the fiscal issues more specifically. Any other sort of suit? Mary? Uh, yes, I'd, I'd like to come in here and uh, echo much of what uh, Lucy has said already. Um, I think there are, the, there are two key areas of concern to us. One is around housing benefit, or the, what has come to be the housing costs element of universal credit. Um, and we, <clears throat> we acknowledged on the day of the Smith Commission that this was a step in the right direction, but it fell short of what we had asked for on the grounds of coherence across the welfare system. So there are lots of boundaries that will need to be managed. So that was one of the first area of interest. The second area of interest was around fuel poverty. And there were, uh, there were moves that I think will be helpful in the long term. Um, of course, they, those rely as well on the, the use of those powers effectively by this parliament uh, once they're transferred. But given the terrain that we're in, the other thing that I think that the Smith Commission was really helpful in, uh, in, in sh shining a light on was the whole area of intergovernmental working, where you have a, dev a mixture of devolved and reserved powers, whatever those are. You need, um, at, at the political and at the official level, to have effective mechanisms for managing those. And I think Smith rightly identified those as issues. And they are they're coming to light as issues through the stakeholder group. And Thank you. In you know, and trying to manage the, the follow-on from Smith. Good. Thank you, Mary. We'll, we'll obviously get into some of this in more detail as we get through the discussion. Bill? Yeah. I think one of your greatest disappointments was because of the, the timescale involved. That the, what We found an enormous enthusiasm amongst disabled people to be involved in the process. So that you'll, as a spillover from the referendum campaign, a lot of disabled people had been energised by that wanted to take part and decide determining their country's future. And that's people from both the yes and no camps, including activists from both camps. Um, and so when we organised consultation events on the Smith Commission, we had to turn people away. Um, and, and again, the timescale meant that we couldn't organise too many. Um, but you know, the ones that we did organise were oversubscribed massively. Um, and it was a very complex area, um, you know, what power should come, et cetera. But again, we managed to devise a way of doing that that actually was meaningful and people could uh, understand what the movement of powers between one parliament and the other might mean. Um, and I think, you know, one of the, the, the key things that was said by uh, a disabled person to us was, that the, the powers that the Scottish Parliament should get should be looked at through a human rights lens. Will they enable the Scottish Parliament to enhance the human rights of disabled people in Scotland or not? Okay. Um, and um, unfortunately, all of that work took place after we had submitted our written evidence to the Smith Commission rather than before. So there's a disconnect between the energy, enthusiasm, etc., and feeling that they were taking part and how much they could influence the actual Smith Commission uh, in its deliberations. So, you know, I think it's something to bear in mind in future that if we want to see local democratic participation, we have to allow the space for that to take place. And that, that's, that's one of the key issues for us. The other one would be around employability, actually. And uh, again, it's the, um, the welfare powers and their interaction with employability. Um, you know, yes, we're going to get the work programme, etc., but the sanctions regime, um, which we think impacts very badly on disabled people and discourages them uh, and, and, uh, from seeking employment and, and seeking the support that we need to get into work, uh, is going to remain in place and, and not be influenced by that. And therefore, you know, the background in which the Scottish Parliament gains those employability powers is going to be affected by certain welfare powers remain at Westminster, the work capability assessment, benefit sanctions, etc. We'll get into the detail know, of know, that just, just shortly. Uh, Peter, then, then Satwa, please. 
I think really just to, to echo some of the points that have been made already, so I'll be brief. I think we, we have struggled looking at the Smith Commission report to see the coherence in the, in the proposals that are in there. Um, and I think we also share, and we've, we've stated several times, about the, the difficulty of the process. Similar to Bill, we had a, a huge response from our membership and beyond to engage in some of the work that we did in the run-up to responding to the Smith Commission. I think we really do need to think seriously about how we maintain that momentum and how we try and engage with people um, as, we, as we go forward into the next stages. And I think that's, that's already going to be difficult, but I think it's something that we need to to turn our minds to. Where we've been a bit more positive, I guess, is um, around some of the proposals, for example, to, um, to provide the power to create new benefits. Now, that, that's useful and that's interesting, and I think that should allow um, some scope for the, the Scottish Parliament, Scottish Government, to take new actions to address problems specific to Scotland. And I think that's, that's something that we were keen in our evidence to the Smith Commission to see um, take place. But I think it goes back to, um, to Dave's point, do we have the, the fiscal responsibility to, to then enable us to use those powers? So that would be a, a key issue for us that seems to be hanging in the air. Thank you, Peter. Thank, thank you. Um, again, I'm going to echo much of what my colleagues have said. We too had engaged quite um, effectively and ex widely with single parents in the lead up um, and during the referendum process and they've shown that energy to continue to be involved um, and particularly around the issues that are affecting them um, and so in terms of welfare benefits the work program and job center plus i think this is one of the areas where they've expressed the most disappointment when we've gone back to them with what's come out of smith and the fact that whilst we are going to have the work program devolved um, the policy framework is going to remain reserved and the regime of conditionality and sanctions, which is having such a negative impact on the families we work with, is going to remain in place. And so in terms of whether we were content with what came out of it, I think when we look back at what the tests were we were going to apply to it around would, would what was being proposed alleviate or reduce poverty and support children and families, particularly single-parent families in that situation, would it avoid or address some of the cliff edges that exist currently between the two regimes? And would it address inconsistencies in the system? I think there's a number of areas that colleagues have spoken about where what's been proposed, what we have, falls short of that. And the one in particular, which was not mentioned at all in Smith, even though we had a session specifically looking at it with Lord Smith, was childcare. And for us, childcare is one of the most stark examples, in a way, of what happens when you have um, supply and demand funding, in a way, being um, across two, um, two parliaments. And so we were very disappointed to see that there was no mention of childcare and also nothing to look at how childcare could be addressed through the greater powers that have been given to Scotland. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you to all the witnesses. I will do, we'll now get into much more of an exchange process. Duncan? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> hopefully, ho hopefully, I can meet that challenge. Um, uh, good morning to, 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 to the panel. When I, when I read um, the, the written submissions, there was a, uh, there, there, were, there was, which I found very interesting. There was this balance uh, of, um, uh, you know, about what was missing, but also I thought when I read the, the submissions was a, a, a determination. Uh, and uh, willingness to participate, participate to make them better. Uh, and indeed, some of the submissions uh, spoke about significant progress uh, from the Smith Commission and a, 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 a lot of uh, uh, positivity in there. Um, the, other, the other aspect, I wonder if the witnesses can maybe focus on what they believe that progress was and, and reflect on some of the submissions and, and, and where those, the, those opportunities to make progress are. Uh, and, and I think Peter mentioned some of that with the right to make new benefits. The, the other one was, of course, this fiscal issue that Dave had mentioned. And there is no... A, a agreement there. Some people are for full fiscal autonomy uh, and, and some aren't. 
some, that, you know, some are for uh, uh, devolution of some of taxes and some not, and partly. And uh, I wonder, uh, I think that might be helpful if we can, um, you know, speak to some of the positions on that for for balance in the committee. Okay, Dave, do you want to, do you want to kick off? Yeah, I'm, I'm... On that financial issue, I mean, we reflected a little bit when we when we did our submission on the situation in Northern Ireland, whereas, you know, there's quite a, a significant um, devolution of a range of policy powers, welfare and, and the like, um, but clearly a problem, as we, as we currently see in terms of the discussions going on in Northern Ireland just now about the funding of that. Um, and it seems to us that there has to be a coherence between um, the amount of money that the Scottish Government spends and how that is reflected, both in respect of the number of taxes it can levy, but also with respect to how the block grant is calculated on that basis, because you can have a whole number of negative incentives within a system where you simply get a block grant which is static. I mean, I'll give you one quick example. Um, the Future Jobs Fund, which was introduced some four or five years ago by um, uh, Alistair Darling was essentially half funded by fiscal stimulus and half funded by savings um, that the DWP managed to um, make because obviously people weren't being paid housing benefit, job seekers allowance and other things. Now, um, under the current circumstances, were John Swinney to look at doing the same thing, um, he wouldn't derive any of those benefits. They would essentially be um, recaptured by the DWP. So it's only useful to have this additional um, devolution of powers if you have a suitably flexible and negotiated fiscal framework which allows some of those spending decisions in Scotland uh, to, be, uh, to derive benefit in Scotland. So we're looking very closely at how, at how that financial... Um, uh, uh, memoranda and how that fiscal arrangement will be negotiated in the next uh, three or four months. Quite a helpful example. Peter, do you want to build on the stuff you said about benefits? Yeah, in terms of, of looking at the positives from, from Smith, I've already mentioned the, the powers to create new benefits and I think Dave has, has very succinctly put uh, the point about how, how that's paid for and, and how that can be uh, if you like, incentivised. I mean, we were also happy about um, devolution of cold weather payments, um, funeral payments, sure start maternity grants and so on. Those things, they, they can make a real difference if, if we use them creatively. I mean, it does, all of this comes down to, at some point, political will to use these new powers in ways that um, reflect the concerns that I think probably the, the whole panel would share. Um, so I don't, want, I don't want to go into then what are some of the... Um, what are some of the negatives? In terms of things that, that weren't devolved, that we were happy they weren't devolved, um, we had mentioned corporation tax. So I think, again, that's, that's an area where we were happy that, um, that, that we don't have new powers and that there, there does need to be some division of uh, responsibilities, appropriate division of responsibilities between uh, the UK and Scotland. And so those would, those would be some, some key points, I think, at this stage. Lucy? Picking up on the, 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 the points about what was in uh, the report that, that was welcome, um, there was a very wide range of, of issues raised by the voluntary sector, as you would expect, from, from such a, a diverse um, sector and such a, a wide range of, 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 of key interests. Um, but, for example, the uh, proposed evolution of the Crown Estate was uh, exceptionally welcome to many rural community organisations and to environmental organisations. Some aspects of, of energy policy was also um, very much welcomed. Consumer protection to, in the interests of, of citizens' rights uh, was also welcomed um, as being uh, uh, proposed to be devolved. Um, I've already said that the aspects of employability, um, are all, given the, the, the complications that we've just discussed, were, are also very welcome because we believe that we can design a system that supports unemployed people, uh, which is much more tailored to their personal circumstances in a population of 5 million, far better than we can in, in a population of, of, of 50 million. In terms of equality, um, uh, that was a very big area of concern for many in the voluntary sector and there was a, a wide range of calls for uh, this parliament to have more control over, over equality law. Um, and while um, uh, Smith concluded that equality law shouldn't um, be devolved, the slightly um, 
enigmatic phrase that the Scottish Parliament can legislate in relation to socio-economic rights in devolved areas has left us all rather intrigued as to what might be possible. Because after all, we only want the powers in order to promote the interests of, of the communities and individuals that we serve and to pursue the human rights um, agenda that, that Bill was referring to all, uh, all earlier. So it may be that there is more scope um, in that phrase than, than perhaps first met the eye. Okay. Duncan mentioned the word progress. Mary, I don't know, I think your own, uh, the implementation could have got that right. Can you give us a flavour of what progress might be going on, how the nuts and bolts are actually progressing? It would be helpful, because uh, that's one of the yes. tenets of Duncan's <clears throat> question. Uh, I'm happy to do that, if uh, it's subject to clar clarifying that what you called the implementation group is the stakeholder group under the okay. Scotland office. Yes, I, yeah. no, that's fine, just to make sure we're, we're talking about the I've same given, thing. I've given it too much... Importance probably in that. Uh, I think we're not quite at that stage yet. <laughs> uh, I wish. Uh, I, I think uh, I would, uh, at the risk of being an anorak, I would refer to paragraphs 44 and 45 of the Smith uh, Agreement. 44 specifically talks about administrative powers, and paragraph 19 makes a cl very clear distinction at the start between administrative power and legislative power, which we, we thought was quite helpful. And, and what's interesting to me is whether. Uh, we need, uh, I, I mean, I think the administrative powers that are identified in paragraph 45 of the Smith Agreement actually give quite a lot of flexibility in the short term, potentially, to the Scottish Government to be able to introduce uh, changes in the way that um, how the housing costs element of universal credit is administered. Um, I, I say potentially because um, we're still trying to clarify, not least through the stakeholder group and through back channels, what exactly the form of the transfer of powers in that area needs to look like, and the position is not clear at all. I, th I think our submission identified that we were still uh, trying to clarify that, and that remains the case today. Um, the, the other issue is around paragraph 45, where, where we were told uh, quite clearly on at the most recent stakeholder group that it would require legislative power to be able to move forward with power to vary, for example, the under-occupancy charge of what's probably more, more commonly known in these circles <coughs> excuse me, uh, as the bedroom tax. And, and that will re rely on legislation and there's nobody banking on legislation any time before next autumn. This autumn, sorry. Yeah. And they also want to, before I move on to Stuart... Yeah, um, I think it was just a very brief point. I mean, we obviously welcome the transfer of disability benefits to the Scottish Parliament. You know, that was one of the key calls by disabled people. Um, the problem being, on the fiscal side, that the Scottish Parliament then needs to have sufficient scope to raise funds to make a more supportive system uh, work uh, in the future. Otherwise, you've got powers, but you, you can't really do very much with the benefits that you've got. But I think, Stuart, I think you were interested in the area of balance and, uh, and that area in terms of some of the stuff Mary began to touch on. So do you want to... Well, if you don't mind, enough, thank you. Thank you very much. I, mean, I felt there was a, a kind of underlying thread that ran through um, all the, the written evidence um, that I read. And I suppose it's this, it is this interesting issue about, as you touched on there, Mary, about administrative powers and what I might call real powers. Um, I, don't, I don't really mean that in that sense, but I mean, in fact, I think you understand what I mean, legislative powers. But I mean, it's some, I thought it was summed up very well in the SCBO um, submission and the conclusion where it says, and I'll just quote from it, these powers cannot be, merely be administrative. To create solutions that work for Scotland, we must be able to design, not just deliver. This has to be genuine, a genuine transfer of responsibility. Um, I just wondered if we could maybe tease apart this, this notion of, um, or how you feel about the Smith package uh, in relation to legislative powers, powers that can change things, uh, and administrative powers, powers that might be able to change things at the margins, but effectively you're just administering a system where the policy decisions and the legislative decisions lie in Westminster. I just want, that seemed to me an issue that seemed to be underlying a lot of the, the submissions that we had today. Mary, could you... Um, yes, I'm happy to, to kick this off. I mean, it, the, we, we started off, we have consistently as an organisation thought that housing benefits should have been devolved at the time when the Parliament was set up so that the powers to support tenants to live in uh, any kind of housing through, in the form of housing benefits should have been devolved. But more recently, in taking advice about the way that social security was going and the formation of universal credit, we had arrived at the position where the whole of social security needed to be devolved in its entirety. And I've had some conversations with some of you around this table about uh, some of the details behind that, because some parties were calling for um, 
elements, including housing benefit, to be devolved on their own. Um, now, the, the problem, and I think Inclusion Scotland have a very clear understanding of this from a very specific uh, grassroots uh, perspective, particularly in relation to disabled people, where some of the trickiest issues arise, is that if you devolve any part of the benefits system, you still have to manage the boundary, whether they're inside universal credit or outside universal credit. But we take the view in the SFHA that uh, the Smith Commission has given us the, uh, a certain array of powers and we will work with whatever those powers are. Um, the administrative ones are actually quite helpful in the short term, as long as they don't end us, end us up, and I hate to refer to Northern Ireland again, but as long as they don't end us up in the same uh, position as Northern Ireland is in, is of, not, of having devolved powers nominally, but not being able to do anything with them, because, as Dave has already referred to, the fiscal consequences of that. I am assured verbally that that's not what we're looking at. I specifically asked this question at the stakeholder group the other day, and I was assured... Um, that that was not the case, but I have seen nothing in writing, and until I have seen something in writing, I remain to be convinced. Um, yes, and, and, and thank you for, for remarking on it. Um, what, what's right behind this, if you, if you peel it right back, is back to my very initial point this morning, which is about how you do governance and how you involve people. And um, we're very uh, intrigued in, in SCVO and other colleagues in the sector by um, uh, the growing emphasis on co-production, uh, involving people in the design of policies that affect them, not just involving them at the, at the sharp end of, of implementation. Um, we hear um, ministers and others, academics, talking now about the Scottish model, uh, which stems from, from, from Christie, which is about prevention, enabling people to, to stay well and, and out of harm's way and in work, um, rather than dealing with them once they've, they've got to, to the acute part of that, that cycle. And what we were interested in particularly was having the, the powers over design of a welfare system which supported people in that preventative upstream way. And we think we've got a lot of experience across the third sector in doing things with people um, and for people uh, differently from the way that the current top-down benefit system uh, operates. And so it's actually quite an ambitious um, uh, vision that we have for a, a kind of system that supports um, people and communities, families, uh, very differently from the way that it's been conventionally done in the UK. And that obviously requires this Parliament to have um, the powers to, 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 to create an enabling environment for the kind of discussion that involves you know, people like my colleagues here today, but right through to, to communities and individuals themselves on a routine basis. So that's why design is important. And yes, I absolutely agree with, with Mary that, that there is a lot in, uh, in, in what Smith does propose and even in the administrative aspects of it that we can do better. But if you want to get fundamental, then you need to have the design uh, powers as well. Okay. Sure, you got any supplementary to that? Yeah, a short supplementary, and it's, it's, it's effectively, it's, it's a different area, but it's, I think it's the same point effectively. And I just wondered if there was any comments on the issue about assigned revenues. It seems to me that effectively the, the VAT example of 10% of VAT being assigned, you know, if you take something off the block grant and then you replace it with assigned revenues from VAT, I'm not, I mean, it, it looks like a power that's transferred, but are, are we just administering a different bit of the system or not actually, you know, there's no, there's no power to change anything there. Just... I'm not sure many people um, uh, agree with me on this, but I'm actually quite a fan of um, assigned revenue. I mean, I, I fully take your point uh, that um, it's not a power in the sense of being um, uh, uh, usable to promote particular behaviours. Um, but almost to return to my point of how do you see the reflection of good Scottish policy in terms of its block grant, then clearly um, a degree of assigned revenue rewards the Scottish Government for economic growth. It rewards it for economic growth um, and essentially, you know, in our view, um, the closer you get to um, a, um, an amount of revenue which is, um, uh, which is derived from positive actions undertaken by the Scottish Government, the better. So, I mean, I take your point about it not being a lever, um, but I still think that it's useful that we move towards a situation where a larger proportion of Scottish revenue um, is derived from positive Scottish Government um, you economic do, you activity. Do accept, you do accept the point that effectively we can't make any changes to that whatsoever, so effectively... In, you know, indeed. We're, we're um, so I, so I, I, one example yeah, would be the yeah. building trade who have yeah. campaigned for many years on mm -hmm. reduced VAT, for example, on repairs, etc. 
Yeah, but we can't do any of that. No, and I, um, I, and I do believe there's categories of activity. It was actually discussed at our um, stakeholder um, group where um, essentially through grant mechanisms you can, you can effectively um, um, find ways of um, providing VAT advantages for people um, for particular activities. But I take your point that it's not, it's not a lever in the sense, um, and, and you wouldn't allow it in many ways to be a lever um, anyway, but I still return to my point that it is, it is useful as a reflection of, of, of overall gov uh, Scottish Government activity to have a, a degree of assigned taxation. Thanks, Dave. I'm going to, Lewis has indicated he wants to ask mm -hmm. a supplementary around the housing issue, and then I'm going to go to Alison Johnson for the sort of last question in the sort of general area, and then I'll move more into the welfare arena. Yeah, I was really following up on Mary Taylor's submission and the, the points that were made in that regarding implementation, and, and I think we've touched on some of that already, but I, I wonder if, it's, if there's more that can be said about how to uh, implement the elements relating to housing that have been uh, included in the Smith Agreement and also around the fuel poverty link, because I think the point made in the written submission is that for those people dealing closely with the housing sector, there are obvious read across from one area of policy or implementation to another and how that would be articulated. And clearly, you're giving advice to government on that. It would be very interesting to have uh, for the committee to hear your view on, on the practicalities of it. Well, I, I mean, on the... On the I, th I think we need to be mindful of the distinction between housing benefit, as it is at the moment, um, and the housing costs element of universal credit. Um, you'll be aware that we have called, uh, along with others, some of whom are uh, at this table, on, the, on this side of the table, for the suspension of rollout of universal credit uh, in the short term, pending clarity around what the additional powers look like, what form they come in, and when they can be introduced. Um, and we, we have been, uh, we've had a reasonably constructive dialogue this week with the DWP, and that's not come to an end yet. Um, none of what Smith talks about actually relates to housing benefit as it sits at the moment. And for everybody that's on housing benefit, be they of working age or of pensionable age, the existing housing benefit system continues to exist until they have been subjected to the, the rollout of universal credit. So the niceties here around administration are about um, making sure that we have a, a safe transition of powers uh, for the housing cost element of universal credit, because in the meantime, the housing benefit side of things actually works, is, is working okay, bedroom tax aside. Um, on the fuel poverty issues, I think what we were saying in our uh, response to Smith was that the transfer of, of uh, uh, powers around warm home discounts and eco-obligations was really, really welcome, um, because we have been bedeviled in recent years by constant changes uh, in the arrangements for those which took very little account of uh, Scottish climate or Scottish market conditions, so that, that's very much welcome. I, I think one of the issues around, uh, to go back to the very earliest point around cohesion, is that uh, the fuel poverty stuff is scattered in different places, and I think it's really incumbent on a committee such as this to make sure that it keeps an eye on um, some of the themes, and I would, I would invite you to make sure that fuel poverty is one of the themes that you keep an eye on for all the reasons that Lucy has already referred to. Because uh, they, they could very easily get lost in the welter of bigger discussions about um, fiscal arrangements and so on. It's part of what I was after, Convener, uh, in relation to when a bill comes forward containing implementation of these proposals, clearly then, at that point, this committee will need to be well uh, advised in terms of the... the precisely recognising those connections. Okay, now, Alison, I think you wanted to ask a question about fuel, uh, fuel poverty at, at some stage, and uh, Mary's just introduced that area, and we're now moving into welfare as a natural progress before I intended to be here. Do you want to deal with that question now? We'll come back to your more general question later, um, and then I'll, then I'll go to Mark. Sure. Um, the, Mary, in, in the SFHA submission, you say that, that we need effective powers in order to ensure the equitable pricing of energy supply across Scotland, wherever the customer lives. Now, that isn't explicitly in Smith, and I wonder if you feel that, that it should have been, and what we might do to take that discussion forward. I mean, obviously, there are things around eco that, that I very much welcome, and it's, it's great that we're going to have an opportunity to, to tailor fuel poverty to better suit the conditions that we face in Scotland. But, you know, regarding the equitability of energy pricing across the country, what would you like to see happen now? 
Um, I'm going to struggle to find it right this very second, but I might come back to you on the detail of which paragraph it's in. I think this uh, relates to the point I was just making about the scattered nature of, or the dispersal of, of uh, reference to discussions about uh, fuel poverty. I, I think it's quite clear that the Scottish Parliament itself will have powers around inter, uh, what, what I would put under the banner of intergovernmental working to uh, hold to account Ofgem and its relation to its, its powers on pricing. Um, so I, I, I would encourage the Parliament to <clears throat> make sure that those are framed in such a way as to allow it to exercise those powers effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Um, sorry, Mark. Yeah, okay, I think my question sort of straddles the line in terms of general, but moving into perhaps the, the welfare discussion, because there's well, a lot after of... You, after you'll come to Rob then, because Rob has a general question on welfare as well. That's, okay. Uh, there's a lot of talk in all of the submissions um, around the um, issues of in-work poverty and um, incomes. And obviously, uh, one of the means with which to boost incomes is obviously uh, to pay people more. And there's a lot of talk in the submissions about a desire to see, for example, a living wage or also to see devolution of minimum wage. And I wonder what, what the view of the panel is around the, the absence of some of these powers, because obviously if one of the ways in which you reduce welfare spend, of course, is to reduce reliance on in-work benefit and paying people a better wage is a perfect method by which to do that. I don't know if, who wants to kick off. Dave, do you that. want to kick it off? Then I'll, then I'll come to uh, Peter Kelly. For instance, to that, so you'll probably not be surprised... Um, uh, to hear what I say. I mean, the first thing to say is um, the trade union movement in Scotland looked very, very closely and not with an uncritical eye at the potential for the devolution of employment law, minimum wages, health and safety, a range of things that we categorise as workplace protections, which in our view fit your, your prescription for improving the quality of work wages and, uh, and, and reducing the, the benefits bill. And we, we were aware of you know, many of the historical arguments that maintaining a, a single market across the UK has, has clear advantages. But in the end, we looked at the fact that um, the Scottish Government already exercises a, a large degree of um, uh, economic powers, economic development powers. It has the justice system, which obviously interacts very clearly with the workplace. And when we looked at it in the round, we took the view that um, those form of workplace protections, um, including a minimum, the setting of minimum wages, fitted better um, with, with devolution and therefore took that... Um, clear view, and it's therefore a clear miss for us that it's not there. Um, if I could just migrate slightly onto the issue of living wages, which is also obviously something slightly different because it's not a mandatory um, a prescription, it's, uh, um, it's, it's a voluntary or, or, or partially voluntary um, approach. Um, we take the view that, I mean, for, you, you'll know that the Scottish Government and most local authorities are now living wage employers. When the Scottish Government did its analysis of the impact of paying the, Scottish, the living wage to all of its employees, um, it found that around 50% of the benefit of doing that, this is back to my previous point, was effectively derived by the DWP, because essentially um, it, was, it, you know, it was people who were on some form of means-tested support, and it came back to them. This is where I moved back to my idea of the, of, of the flexible financial uh, arrangements. Is it really right that the Scottish Government taking a conscious decision to directly pay the living wage to its employees should not derive uh, the full benefit of that budgetary decision? So even though we're disappointed, even though we're disappointed um, at the, the lack of core employment powers being devolved, we still think there's imaginative ways that we could look um, at, uh, um, at incentivising what we would consider to be good behaviours around, around pay and, and, and quality of work. Yeah. It's already said, I mean, we had also called for the, the devolution of national minimum wage, and it goes back to that point that we were making at the start about coherence. So, we think obviously there was a bit of coherence, there was coherence in the um, submission that we made to Smith. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it's, it's about with, with a range of um, employability powers that we had hoped would have come and with a range of, of um, social security powers that we would have hoped would have come, then it would be natural to have the national minimum wage as part of that overall package to support people as they make a transition from out of work to, to in work. So, so, yeah, we're, we're disappointed um, with the lack of uh, devolution of the national minimum wage. There is still much that we can do 
um, and I think much to the Scottish Government and um, a range of organisations around the table and outside um, Parliament are doing to promote a living wage, but I think fundamentally to, to bring um, the, the legal mechanism to set the floor to wages would have been very helpful, I think, in, in linking um, the economic development uh, ambitions of uh, the Scottish Government and Scottish Parliament. I think, I think Dave makes an interesting point around the, the I think it's the coherence element again, and also who it is that derives financial benefit. Obviously, the individual derives benefit because you know they're they're moving into a situation where they're relying on uh, a secure pay rather than having to rely on on, on top up benefit. And I wonder if Satwak, because I noticed in um, in your submission when you talk about key policy issues affecting single parents in Scotland, two of those are financial security in and out of employment and also in work poverty and low pay, high turnover economy. It strikes me that the kind of asks that Dave Moxham is looking for are very much in tandem with what your, your organisation would be calling Absolutely, for as well. Absolutely, very much. And um, as we say in our submission, we were disappointed that employment remained reserved, particularly the national minimum wage. We had called in a, for in our submission to Smith for that to be devolved um, and for the hopefully the minimum wage to be set in line with, with the living wage. One of the big issues for the families we work with is that we've got a welfare and benefits system that's got a work first agenda. But for many of the families that we work for, work doesn't pay. And so we find single parents enter work at the same rate, relatively speaking, as the rest of um, the population, but they tend to leave work much more quickly because of the, 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 the additional costs of working and the stresses of working and the fact that they end up in situations of finding themselves in quite severe in-work poverty. And that's why we felt, similar to what Peter has said, that if you're looking at a sort of um, a model of progression from being out of work to being into work, we would see um, a wage that provides a decent standard of living as being a key cornerstone of that. So we would have seen it as part of that coherent package of support through employability into work and then to retain work and to progress further into work. So that's why we'd called for it. And let Duncan come in and slightly supplementary and then I'll come to you. Just a quick, a quick supplementary and just to explore this one. I noted that Dave and understand why the trade unions would have that uh, tension here about coming to that decision, given that we've, and I say we, that we have opposed regional levels of minimum wages, you know, in the past. But more interestingly, I think it's a wee bit of leap of, leap of faith that we'd expect those minimum wages to go up. And I want to contrast that with, the, I think, Poverty Alliance position and, and, and STC's position, where they have said they were against the devolution of corporation tax because that could be a race to the bottom. Why wouldn't, why are we confident that setting a minimum wage here in Scotland wouldn't be a race to the bottom? The evidence seems slightly clearer to start with on corporation tax because the Scottish Government had said that it wanted to reduce it. So that was, uh, that was um, I suppose, a fairly easy judgment to make. Um, I think, um, I mean, our, our main view was, number one, I mean, Scotland as a functioning economy compared to the rest of the UK is around average, right, in terms of its uh, levels of employment, in terms of its output, in terms of its productivity. Therefore, the idea that Scotland would, um, if you like, um, attempt to seek inward investment um, through some trickle-down mechanism of, of, of lowering wages seemed to us to be economically unlikely. It seemed to us that the, um, uh, the whole flavour of the referendum campaign, the nature of the two biggest political parties in Scotland, did not lend us to the view that Scotland would be likely to wish to reduce its minimum wage compared to the majority parties um, across the UK. So, um, for a range of reasons, we didn't um, think it likely in the short to medium term. We also reflected on the fact that Northern Ireland currently has that power and there's been no race to the bottom, even though Northern Irish products activity and, and economic output would, from one, from one economic standpoint, not mine, uh, make it a, a, some sort of candidate for that kind of um, competitive activity. So we felt, and as I say, as, as I reflected, it was a, a, um, a, a, a judgment that we, we undertook very, very carefully. We didn't see the prospect in the short to medium term of a race to the bottom. In fact, we saw some prospect of a race to the top. I think I'll come to you and then Bill and then we'll come back to the more general issues on welfare, Rob. Yeah. I think 
with, with any of the new powers um, that, that could have come to Scotland and that are coming, there's an inherent danger that, I mean, around welfare benefits, you could make the, the very same argument that, you know, potentially they could be levelled down. And I think, as, as Dave's expressed, we've made a judgment that on, on some things that's, that's less likely to happen. Um, and we want to see um, we want to see those things increased. I think around the minimum wage, it was it was an interesting call. I think, and and I think it was important that the uh, the trade unions um, took the position that they did. Um, again, it goes back to policy coherence. I think when the minimum wage was was introduced, um, there was a very strong case when you know this was the first national minimum wage that we had in 1999 when it was. It was first introduced. Before that, we'd had this. Well, we didn't have anything pre-99, but up until two, um, 2000, uh, sorry, 93, we'd had the wages council system, which was that patchwork. So I think when uh, speaking as campaigners who'd, who'd campaigned for the minimum wage, you know, we wanted to see that that um, unified system across the UK. I think we've moved on from there and I think that in terms of the powers of the Scottish Parliament and the, the opportunities that were around, I think we wanted to see again that coherence around how do we um, set the conditions to address poverty, to promote social justice in Scotland and the minimum wage would have been one way to do that and it's not, not just about the level of the minimum wage but also the enforcement which I think is a key issue. I mean we would like to see a, a, a progressive increase in the minimum wage but I think we need to, to do more around the enforcement and that's an issue that's been um, uh, withered on the vine for, for many years I think. So again these powers would have, would have allowed us again it's about political will, we, we would have to assume that there's political will to enact and to use these powers in the way that many of us um, around this table would want. Bill? Yeah, again, we we were very careful to warn all the disabled people that came to our engagement events um, that you know the, the, simply the transfer of powers wouldn't change anything. <laughs> wouldn't change anything for the better. It wouldn't change anything for the worse um, because those powers would then have to be used in one way or another, and they could be used you know to affect our lives in the negative rather than for the good. But nevertheless, the overwhelming message that we got back from 80 to 90 percent of people was we want equalities law and we want employment law because if employability is going to be addressed then these are key policy areas that affect employability of disabled people less than half of disabled people are in work those that are in work a majority are in entry level jobs they depend on the minimum wage being set at a level that removes them from poverty otherwise they're just exchanging out of work poverty for in work poverty. So, you know, that was why they, they got it. They saw it as a coherent thing to, to bring all it up here so that you could affect employability over the longer term and address the particular issues that, you know, single parents, disabled people, etc., face in the, the current labour market. Rob Gibson. Thank you. I, I'd like to turn to universal credit, not the principle, but the practice uh, of what might happen. Uh, we were provided in this committee by the Parliament Information Centre with a note that says, if a universal credit claimant is uh, receiving any of the reserve benefits below, uh, they have uh, been increased by the Scottish Parliament, then they will get a reduction in their universal credit award pound for pound. This could mean a universal credit recipient is worse off. Um, however, this eventually could be offset if the Scottish Parliament decided to increase the universal credit award as well. A similar situation might arise if the Scottish Parliament introduced a new benefit, and in this case there would be a need to be a discussion between the two governments about how the new benefit would interact with universal credit. So, panel, would you uh, agree that this would undermine the Scottish Parliament's ability to improve outcomes for individuals by topping up reserve benefits? Um, I'm happy to kick off on that. I've not seen any such note I'm not entirely surprised that it exists. I'd be very happy to have a look at it if you're able to share it with us. 
Um, and, and I think on the basis of what you've read out and your conclusion on the basis of what you've read out, that's a fair comment. And I think that goes back to what I was saying about Northern Ireland. Panelists are aware that piece of evidence is on our, our website. I'm sorry, I haven't I, I'm, seen not, it. I'm not suggesting you should have necessarily seen it, but as a result of the very first discussion we had with Alistair Carmichael, that issue was raised. And we wrote to Alistair Carmichael to, to confirm whether or not the position of SPICE was accurate. Unfortunately, we've not had, yet had the response to, 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 to see whether that position of SPICE was agreed to by either the Scottish Government or the UK Government. Um, so you might, all, you might be a wee bit in the dark here, but if there's anybody that wants to raise, deal with it, please feel free. I apologise if I'm misunderstanding, in which case you'll, you'll stop me quickly. Um, if referring to point 55 in the Smith Commission report, which is any new benefits or discretionary payments introduced by the Scottish Parliament must provide additional income for a recipient and not result in an automatic offset in reduction, then you can interpret that two ways. And, and I did raise this at, at the meeting that Mary and I were at, the stakeholder meeting. You can interpret that as you can't introduce anything which might um, result in that situation, or you can say anything that you introduce must not have that effect. Now, it was my impression, and I, I, Mary will say whether it's right or wrong, um, from our meeting on Monday, that it was the latter rather than the former, which is to say that those benefits, top-up benefits, could be introduced, and the rule was it should not affect um, somebody's universal closet. Now, how that is written, whether that's in draft clauses or whether that's in uh, financial memoranda, which would involve both governments, including the DWP, I think is still to be investigated. But I very much hope that it's the latter interpretation and not the former. Otherwise, we'll have moved no further forward um, at all. Anyone else on that? that point? Yeah, very, very much on that. A carer's allowance, for example, is one of those benefits where, if it's increased, it results in a pound-for-pound -pound reduction in income support at the moment, and, we, and similarly we'd do with universal credit. So if the Scottish Parliament decided to increase carers' allowance by £10, as it stands just now, that would result in £10 less being paid in universal credit. So you know, there has to be some arrangement whereby any increase by the Scottish Parliament is matched by a disregard by the UK Parliament. And I don't... Whereas Smith says that this is what must be achieved, it doesn't say how it's to be achieved. And to give you an idea, with the other benefits, that are, although disability living allowance is not taken into account in, in, in terms of um, a reduction being made to universal credit, it does result in disregards and premiums uh, in universal credit and income support. So... If the UK government has a benefit ceiling which implements, and, and that's an overall benefit ceiling of the amount that they spend on benefits and an individual benefit ceiling, right? And the Scottish Parliament again acts to increase these benefits or increase the number of people receiving those benefits, then that will have an effect on the UK exchequer in terms of the amount of benefits that it has to pay out in income support, because if, if you are more generous and award more people personal independence payment in Scotland than is generally the case in England, then that will result in a higher bill for the UK exchequer in universal credit, because it will have to pay premiums and it will have to disregard that money. So the savings that it thinks it's going to achieve in certain areas of benefit, uh, welfare reform, it will not achieve if the Scottish Parliament acts differently. And again, I don't think Smith goes into that at all. Um, about, again, what, what the interaction, and this is why it was so important to bring Social Security as a block to Scotland rather than piecemeal, because the interaction between non-means-tested benefits and means-tested benefits is much more complex than Smith envisages. Well, that's a fascinating area you're opening up there, and it certainly says to me, like the committee agreed last week that we needed at some stage to bring on some sort of benefits experts to help us when the clauses come. But it would be useful, I think, if you could explain a bit more of that in detail in writing to us uh, so we can get a time to absorb it and understand it. Um, Rob, you want to oh, build on that? I echo that the convener is saying that Alistair Carmichael was unclear and unable to articulate this. You would agree, of course, that we need to deal with any other complications that could be envisaged in this and that we need clarity in this matter going forward at an early stage. 
I, I, would, uh, I would only add at this point that the, this was an, a live topic at the stakeholder group earlier this week, and uh, in the sense of the issues being aired, uh, I don't think that we were seeing any solutions being proposed or clarified, but it is a, a live topic for discussion. Um, I think there is another area where, uh, which it may be of interest to the committee to know that we were assured that where the Scottish I can't remember whether it was the government or the parliament took decisions that would benefit um, the, the, that actually created savings for the UK government, which is the opposite of the situation that uh, Bill identified, um, that those savings would accrue to the Scottish parliament or government, whichever, in the first place. And I specified um, housing as an example, just to test whether this would work. So, for example, if the Scottish parliament were to agree... Uh, a greater budget for housing investment, particularly in social housing by housing associations, um, and at, at, at enhanced rates of subsidy, um, that would produce uh, more housing at lower rents um, than otherwise than would otherwise be the case. And those tenants who were then potentially living in expensive private rented accommodation on expensive local housing allowances would then move over to a cheaper housing cost elements of uh, universal credit or housing benefit, and that would create a saving to the UK exchequer. And I was assured by the Treasury that, that the saving would then accrue to the Scottish Parliament. So I commend to you the uh, uh, enhanced investment uh, in housing. This is very complex, obviously, and slightly concerning, because we're only a week away from seeing the actual clauses, and yet we haven't bottomed out some of this yet, obviously, in terms of the final positioning. Um, so I hope by the time we get to next Thursday and the clauses are published, that a lot of this is able to be bottomed out. But any further written evidence that people want to provide us in that area would be very useful. Rob, have you got any further supplementaries in this? Jake, but it's about is sanctions. It, is it still welfare? Uh, it is, yes. Right. I'm going, after Rob's dealt with the welfare, unless there's anybody else got welfare issues, I'm going to go to Alec Johnson on taxation issues. Yeah, um, we're talking about housing and at the moment, and I think the question about sanctions and so on have a particular bearing in this. Uh, last year, the SFHA published a report that set out how benefits sanctions are compounding the impact of welfare reform in two important areas, directly where sanctioned tenants are falling into arrears as a result of seeing their housing benefit claims suspended, and secondly, indirectly, where sanctions are leaving tenants destitute with no money for rent, fuel or food. Um, what's your view on the impact that the UK-wide sanction system would have on the ability of your members' tenants to pay their rent? Well, the, the situation is as it was, as we reported last year, only my guess would be if we were to update the figures, we would find that more tenants have been sanctioned um, uh, since, since that time and with all the consequences that we identified in that report at that time. Um, and, and this underpins some of our concerns around uh, universal credit at the moment and uh, the way in which that's being rolled out and, and hence the subject of act active dialogue with the DWP. So I take it you're saying that you think that perhaps the control of the sanction system should be devolved to the Scottish Parliament? Well, uh, if, if uh, our, our original position to Smith was that the whole of Social Security yeah. should be yeah. uh, devolved, and so that, I mean, we said that housing, the housing element of it was a step in the right direction. Yeah. Sanctions is clearly not a step in the right direction. I, I, um, I'm sure Bill will want yeah. to have more to say on this. Yeah. Sorry. Um, thank you. We found increasingly that the single parent families that we're working with are being subjected um, to sanctions. And what we found is that there um, tend to be two trends with, um, as a result of, um, well, with the sanctions. One is that they're being misapplied so that the actual advisors within the job centres themselves are not aware of the flexibilities that there are currently that they can apply to single parents around childcare, hours they should be looking for work, etc. And secondly, that um, it's not that they're not unaware. They are aware. They're still applying them. And what we're finding is increasing numbers of cases that were taken to appeal are being overturned on appeal. But you still have the situation where these families are having to live with very little or no income for the period that they're being sanctioned and are having to rely upon food banks 
and other charitable sources to be able to survive. And that was one of the reasons why we ourselves had also called for social security to be devolved alongside um, the work programme and Job Centre Plus so we could create a system which wasn't reliant on such draconian um, conditionality and sanctions. Thank you for that. Um, I think Stuart has one of the areas to deal with in welfare. Alex, and then we'll come to you on taxation. Yeah, thank you. It's more on uh, kind of poverty as compared to welfare as a whole, if that's okay. All right, thank you, Kimbina. Um, so, uh, the question is mainly aimed towards uh, Peter, Satwat, and Mary. Uh, now, in paragraph, oh, in the Smith report, uh, section 73 and 74, uh, highlight the issues of the proliferation of uh, payday loan shops and the proliferation of fixed odds betting terminals. Uh, now, it's, it's an, these are two areas where I've been, uh, I've been involved in and campaigning on uh, for some time. Now, uh, in terms of the Smith, recommend also for the powers for these to come to the Scottish Parliament. Now, uh, I'm, not, I'm not aware of uh, any, uh, any of yourselves actually mentioning uh, these within the submissions, and, and I accept uh, that, uh, that it might be considered to be on the, uh, on the margins of, of, the, of the bigger issues that we have been discussing. But nonetheless, uh, there will be an impact. Uh, upon, uh, upon the area and the people and the organisations uh, that you actually deal with. Um, do you think that, uh, that, first of all, that these powers, do you, think, do you welcome these powers actually come to the Scottish Parliament? Uh, but secondly, uh, do you think that uh, with these powers that, that there will actually be uh, an, a, an opportunity for this Parliament to actually deal with, uh, or deal with the powers effectively and uh, for the, the people that you actually uh, work with and represent for them to actually have a better outcome. Peter, do you want to pick up that from the Poverty Alliance perspective sure. first? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think we would welcome those powers. Um, in a lot of the, the work that we've done with um, community representatives over many years, a consistent theme uh, that people talk about is the, the only uh, shops, or the only occupied premises that they'll, they'll have in some communities are, are pubs, bookies and, and chip shops. And that, that's something that's come out over many years. But I think, so I think powers to, to regulate um, in those areas, particularly the, the fixed odds betting machines, would be, would be useful. I think, again, it's about how do we use those powers, because local authorities obviously have um, powers around um, licensing of, of betting shops. So, so we need to think about how can those things be used. That's, that's, that's a power that's useful but we then need to, to look quite seriously about the, the, wider, um, the wider implications of that power and how it's used, particularly devolved down to the, the local level. Bill? Is a disabled person is three times as likely to have a payday loan, even though they know it might not be in employment, <laughs> than, than a non-disabled person. So, yeah, the proliferation is something that needs to be addressed, but obviously... The proliferation is there because of the grinding poverty that you know, many of our citizens ex experience, and that has to be addressed as well. I mean, um, the point I was going to make about um, sanctions was um, in the work-related activity group of uh, employment and support allowance, a disabled person is four times as likely to be sanctioned as to be found a job. Now, <laughs> that suggests to me that you've got a programme that isn't about work at all. It's about punishing people for not being in work. I'll just echo what's been said um, by colleagues. Certainly, sort of um, payday loans are very high interest loan companies are one of the um, areas of concern that comes to us. Again, more and more families that we work with are in higher levels of debt and they're in spiralling debt as a result of being in poverty. And, for, and then on top of that, when they're sanctioned, having to find a way of getting money and um, having to resort to this sort of high interest lending. So anything that we could do to be able to regulate that, but at the same time to look at what the alternatives are and to support families to be able to find the alternatives to sources of income when they need them. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is MD OK, we'll go to Alec Johnson, I think. That's probably the right thing to do at this stage. And move Thanks into the, the taxation area now. Looking through the papers, there are a number of proposals for uh, devolution of tax powers, and of course there are proposals within the question itself. Now, uh, yeah, we'll be honest with each other, I presume that you don't want these taxes devolved so that we can cut them. Uh, uh, and we've talked about what we could spend uh, that money on. But of course the trend in recent years has been for the proportion of GDP 
uh, taken in tax to be reducing in the UK. And uh, I presume you would wish to reverse that trend using these powers in Scotland. What do you see uh, as the, the limit to the expansion of uh, the government take in terms of a uh, proportion of GDP in Scotland? What do you look, need? You, you're, look, you're looking at me as the, the one most likely to advocate higher you taxes. Just to and, be you're, <laughs> and you're spot on. Um, uh, uh, I think there's fairly specific um, and fairly clear limits to which the amount of tax levied in one part of uh, a highly integrated economy will be different from, from the other. Um, I think putting an exact figure on that is different, but if you're saying that you know, overall UK tax take is, I don't know, the current figure, 38 39%, would Scotland be like? to jump to 47, 48%? Clearly not. Um, that, that wouldn't happen. Um, I slightly disagree with you about tax rises and, and, and falls because one of the points about devolving enough of a basket of taxes is that it does empower the Scottish Government potentially to vary those taxes within that basket. So, for instance, and I'm not necessarily advocating it, you could make adjustments to income tax if you were looking to introduce a land value tax. For, I, I'll just give that as an example. So, um, it, is, it is potentially about um, adjusting taxes up and down if you have a sufficient basket and enough taxes in order to operate um, an effective system. Um, but I would not envisage, um, you know, beyond certain things that we've heard about potentially retaining a 50p tax rate um, in Scotland, I would not envisage enormous discrepancies between uh, overall tax take uh, in Scotland and the rest of the UK, because I think there's a, a number of ta practical reasons why that wouldn't take place. There's a possibility to do a number of limited, specific good things and to convince the people of Scotland uh, that that's a good idea. I don't personally believe the argument over higher taxes has necessarily been won just because I, uh, just because I advocate it, but the STUC would definitely recognise the limits um, uh, to such divergence. Lucy? Uh, I think it's probably fair to say that there is a very live debate um, amongst the organisations that, that my organisation represents and, and works with about the, the role of, of taxation, um, not just in, in terms of overall higher or lower levels, um, but how it's distributed. And I think the, 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 that kind of debate, not just um, more or less, but how we use the taxation system uh, uh, in a designed and creative way to bring about a different balance of resources across individuals, families and communities is the one that we would like to engage in, in more. Um, but if you want to redistribute through taxation, you need to tax more and spend more. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that that was the case at all. I think it's about how you think about the taxation system, and it's also about how you think about the economy in the round. The main thing that we've been calling for, for in, in recent months is for a, a broader debate about the type of economy that we want, uh, which looks at things that are beyond just pure GDP, but about what's important um, to individuals, families and communities, and that could be forms of measures of well-being um, and, and human need, not just about um, cash. And I think a broader debate about the economy is one that we would like to engage with. There are some specific points as well um, that we did raise in our submission to, to Smith around the role of charity and the taxation system. Uh, we have a very, very clumsy and clunky um, en engagement between uh, charities as particular entities and the tax system at the moment. And it could be designed to uh, work with civil society organisations in a much more creative way that supports people um, uh, by the organisations that support them rather than directly. And we would like to see that um, debate opened up a bit more as well. Alex, any more? Yeah, sorry. No, sorry, it was, it, was, it was actually on um, that you have to raise taxes to raise more revenue. You don't. Um, you could, for example, raise more revenue by getting more people in employment. Um, you could raise more revenue through um, increasing the amount of childcare that's available to parents and therefore encouraging more parents to be in full-time work rather than part-time work or not in work at all. There are other ways to generate revenue rather than just raising taxes. Um, and in our own case, we, we were very keen to see access to work devolved to Scotland because for every pound that uh, the DWP spends on access to work, the Treasury gets back £1.60 in revenue. That's the sort of tax raising that you could go about without necessarily um, raising 
uh, the level of the tax, but you, you get more of a tax take, and it's the interaction of different policy areas with taxation that you're then talking about. Horrified to realise just how close to my way of thinking he is for that <laughs> sort of thing. But we, we, we have. <laughs> are, are we not perhaps um, mismatched here in that we've spent an hour and 15 minutes talking about what we want to spend in a Scotland uh, after further devolution? And we still seem to be avoiding the implications about the fact that that money has to be raised somehow. And with current projections suggesting that the, the tax take in GDP for the UK as a whole is on its way down to about 35%, that even staying where we are is going to create a divergence and that that divergence could be quite notable. I, mean, I, I take the general point, although anyone who's read the Institute of Fiscal Studies um, analysis of that full to 35% um, would only draw the conclusion that they, they stopped briefly from splitting their sides laughing at the Chancellor's uh, projections before before trying to write their analysis of that. So, I mean, I take your point that that's the intended area of, of, of UK government um, uh, um, spending. I don't think it's going to happen because I think um, the, the infra some of the very, very basic infrastructure of the whole of the UK would fall apart if, um, if those, um, if those uh, plans were actually implemented. But I do take your point that um, we are in a position compared to five or six years ago, seven or eight years ago, where the, um, the proportion of tax is lower um, and that that is going to be a challenge uh, for all. Um, I do think it's absolutely reasonable for government um, in whatever jurisdiction to be able to lay out how through um, modest increases in taxation and a change in, uh, in the tax system, how it intends to reap medium and uh, uh, long-term economic advantages that will, uh, that will be derived from that. So I think it's entirely reasonable. I refer to, to my, uh, my example about the Future Jobs Fund. It would be entirely reasonable for the Finance Minister in Scotland with new powers to say, we wish to, through a combination of taxation and borrowing, um, invest in job creation in Scotland in order that in the medium and long term we will reap those benefits. Um, that's fairly sensible mainstream economics in most countries um, in Europe uh, and I don't see any reason why with reasonable tax powers a Scottish um, Finance Secretary wouldn't be in a position to do that sort of thing. So, notwithstanding the fact that I actually agree with Bill but take the view that that would take quite a period of time to achieve maximum effect. In broader terms do the tax powers proposed by the Smith Commission fit in with the model you imagine? Just briefly, because I know I um, intend to speaking too much, they move further towards the, they move further towards that situation than we were previously, and they are positive. The tax powers we would, as I say, have gone further in, in, in relation to the tax basket, but they go further. I mean, in, income taxes are important, and the ability to vary the bands within income taxation is particularly important. So it's helpful, undoubtedly, in, in achieving what would be my aims. Um, the SFHA has not commented on this, so I'm, this is a, I'm offering a personal view um, uh, that, that what we are looking at here in the transfer of powers around taxation um, create the opportunity for greater fiscal responsibility over the amounts of money that are raised um, for the Scottish Government to spend, and that can only be a good thing and build on uh, the democratic engagement that there has been and lead to a much more mature dialogue around policy making in future. Thank you. Okay, Alex. Uh, Lewis, I think you wanted an area of taxation issues as well. Yes, thanks very much. And I, I, again, I'll give uh, Dave Moxham the opportunity to talk a little more uh, if, if, if he would like that. Um, <clears throat> because I know the STUC, in considering fiscal uh, options, considered both full fiscal autonomy and increased devolution of taxpayers backed up by a continuing block grant. I wonder if you could say a little as to why you went for the latter as opposed to the former uh, and how you uh, respond to the uh, agreement that's been made. Well, I suppose um, at one level, um, what I won't do is quote the oil price because I'm not sure if it's um, uh, below $40. But uh, the, serious, the, the serious consideration um, for us was that the, the Scottish Government's 
picture under independence of what was obviously full fiscal autonomy because it, um, uh, because it was independence included a range of additional powers that they thought they were going to be able to use under independence um, to promote economic growth around migration, um, reductions in spending on, on defence, which as a package was potentially persuasive. Um, if you then looked at the, um, at, at the proposals that, that Smith was looking at, many of those powers clearly weren't going to, be, um, weren't going to end up with the Scottish Parliament. Um, so it was a different calculation to look at um, the, uh, 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 how appropriate and, and useful for Scotland's full fiscal autonomy would be um, out, out with the lack of those powers. Our conclusion was, and as I say, it was, it was well in advance of the, the, the current position on oil, but our conclusion was that some, some element of a block grant which recognised Scotland's historic and future oil take, um, in addition to significantly enhanced um, tax powers, would provide a more stable but also fair reflection of Scotland's overall fiscal relationship with the, United, uh, with, with the rest of the United Kingdom, and that's how we came to RPA. And, and do you feel that... Uh, and Yes, you, the, the, the submission you made certainly made that. Do you feel that what has emerged from the Smith Agreement provides that certainty both in terms of an increased evolution of tax powers but also the certainty of continuing block grant, continuing Barnett Formula funding from the UK? I think it does. I mean, I think that the, there's been some fairly clear undertakings um, from, um, from, from the three parties who, um, uh, uh, who were pro-devolution and independence. There's been some fairly clear undertakings from them, and that appears to be reflected in, um, in, the, um, uh, in the conclusions of the Smith Commission. I don't want to re return to this again. There is, there, there is a lot of devil in the detail in terms of, number one, what mechanisms are used um, for setting the, uh, the original original level and then indexation um, after that. I'm certainly no expert on that, so don't ask me to go into too much uh, detail. And also to return to this point about the, the financial framework, the new financial framework in which it will be operated, i.e. how flexible would that block grant be in, in terms of being able to recognise the impact of Scottish government spend on, on UK coffers and, 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 and therefore to reflect that in, uh, in a year-on-year -year settlement. That, that's helpful. I wonder if I could ask the other witnesses if they agree that a continuing element of block grant funding through the Barnett formula uh, of, Scot of devolved powers and services in Scotland from the UK Government is an important part uh, of uh, the balanced settlement that, that Smith offers. Um, yes, certainly I think it flows from what I was saying earlier about fiscal responsibility, that there, the, the, uh, that remains the case, and that, and that it's, it's clear and transparent in terms of the mechanism for it. I think the whole issue here in Smith is around detriment uh, between the two governments, and um, I, my sense um, so far is that that is recognised as an issue that has to be worked through, but we're not at the point yet where we know quite what form that will take. Um, my, my understanding from discussions that we've had earlier this week is that uh, the position, the, the challenges understood in theory, what the practical mechanisms are for delivering it have still to be worked through. And, and I mean, this, this comes back to what will happen next, next Thursday when we see the draft clauses. I, I'm not sure that this is the sort of thing that will actually feature in draft clauses. I'm not sure if it's susceptible to clauses or whether there's some kind of intergovernmental memorandum or something. Um, so I, I'm not convinced. I, well, yeah, no, I'm not convinced that, that we'll see something next Thursday that actually clarifies this. Okay. Um, Peter? Yeah, just to... To answer the question, is it, is it right that that element of block grant remains, then yes. I mean, one of, the, one of the points that we were making in our submission to Smith was that whatever the, um, the end result, whatever the recommendations, is it did need to reflect the outcome of the, of the referendum, which I think, I mean, we, we obviously argue about the, 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 the detail of what that that outcome is, but I think, you know, there are things like, for example, pensions, where I think many of us, I don't want to speak for my colleagues, but many of us would have said, no, that's a responsibility that, that must be shared in the, mm -hmm. in the current context. So I think in, in that respect, then um, it's, it's clearly acceptable that, that some of the revenue comes from, from block grant. 
Thank you, Liz. I think Rob had a question on tax. It's right? about tax, yes, and uh, I'd just like to explore a couple of things. We've, we, we've talked about getting more people into work, but um, the STUC said uh, to us that uh, they believed in the empowerment of communities that requires adequate control of land ownership uh, and its use for the purposes of tax avoidance, whilst in many cases subsidies are drawn down for farming and forestry activities. Now, there's a whole area of taxation in there about avoidance that uh, potentially could reap uh, benefits for the Exchequer. Um, there's a whole potential for land value tax, as has been briefly mentioned, to bring in a different uh, sources of income rather than continually uh, you know, working out the balance of the working poor uh, to be able to contribute. Um, this, the Crown Estate Commission uh, revenues that can be spent in local communities to boost services at a local level. Do you agree that the, the debate about tax has to take on the potential in Scotland and whether we're able to apply it to things like tax avoidance, to things like the ability uh, to have a new form of taxation that actually brings in money from people who are not paying it at the moment? Dave, that's probably I, what you I, I agree, and, and, and obviously the, um, the, the legislation that has been introduced and passed at the Scottish Parliament with respect to the existing tax powers does have fairly strong, and I would argue stronger than the, 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 the UK's um, provisions with respect to tax avoidance. Now, their current application is obviously limited because they, limit, because they apply themselves um, at the moment to only a couple of small taxes, but there's no reason, of course, that that principle, which is very close to what we would describe as an anti-avoidance principle, um, can't be um, extended to, to all of the taxes which, um, which will eventually be delivered, we hope, through, uh, through this process. Um, one other point, and specifically with respect to land and land reform, um, we do see, and partly because of the Crown Estate devolution and for other reasons, we do see some additional potential for land reform which we think will dovetail fairly effectively with what at least the Scottish Government has stated that it wishes to do with respect to land reform. This isn't, isn't necessarily an uncomplicated issue, but we think the missing part in that is, is, is capital gains tax and inheritance tax, which um, if you really want to complete the full suite of powers, which allows you to, at the end of the day, effectively tax something which is a very, very static um, and therefore taxable um, resource, then I would have added those two things. It's not unproblematic, but I think that we should have been, uh, we should have been looking to do that. That's very helpful indeed. Yeah. Well, now, is that has completed all the questions on taxation? Probably has. Alison, I think you had a, a very general question, um, which I, I didn't allow you to ask at the beginning. So you want to deal with that now? I think it's maybe Linda next, and we're probably winding up, I think, at this, after that. I've got that right. Unless there's anybody else who wants to indicate just now. So, so there's, sorry, there's a couple of people who've still got questions. So, Alison first. Thank you, convener. Um, I think in particular, well, you've all spoken this morning about the level of engagement um, with, with all those you work with. And, you know, I think that's been such an important part of what's happened in the last few months. And I think it's fair to say with the number of submissions Smith received, they weren't all given the attention we might like. And even now, I think there's a feeling that we're not involving wider Scotland as well as we could be or should be. Now, there's obviously, uh, around some of these recommendations, I think there's still a great deal of uncertainty. And some people are probably going to get the outcome they expect, and others are going to get something entirely different, because I think there's very narrow and broad ways to define some of these recommendations. But I'm just wondering how you think. You speak about a citizen-led process going forward, um, after the clauses are printed, how we might best involve wider Scotland. And you're looking for you know, innovative ways of really involving the public that go beyond the usual tick box, you know, sort of tick box consultation exercise. I just wondered if you could expand on that a bit, how we might make sure that we don't lose those important voices as the process continues. Well, maybe if, if I could kick off and, 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 and say that in, to some extent I am speaking here on behalf of, of, of other colleagues here and, and out with this room because there is a, a very live conversation going on across Scottish civil society about the need for uh, a process and a space for discussion about these very important issues uh, which out, sits outside of the, 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 the quite closed rooms that, that currently exist and the very rapid and, and rushed processes that, that we've been involved in. Um, we, we've, we've drawn quite heavily on the experience 
experience of, of colleagues elsewhere in the European community uh, around the, the concept and theme of social partnership, where it isn't just government or politicians that take these decisions about how we are governed and, um, and what the priorities are for, for our society and our communities, but a much more open form of governance that involves all of us, whether it be in private business, whether it be in the trade union movement, whether it be in faith communities, or be in the, the many organisations that make up uh, Scotland's um, third sector. Um, and we would like to see that as a theme of how we do democracy, how we do governance in this country uh, going forward. And in that context, look again again at these very sort of difficult technical issues that, that's dominated uh, much of this morning's uh, conversation. In order to do that, we need a process and a space created um, for it to happen. And some kind of citizen-led process, um, we, we've talked perhaps about a convention, um, where on an ongoing basis, on, an, on a, a periodic review basis, uh, we can actually look at whether the balance of powers between the, the respective parliaments, and indeed within Scotland, the balance between different levels of government and the engagement of, of communities is happening correctly. Because we've had a lot of talk in this, this parliament in the, in the last uh, couple of years around the need for uh, empowerment. I've mentioned the jargon word already, co-production. Um, what I think we worry about in the third sector is whether that is um, uh, really happening in reality or whether it is just rhetorical at this stage. And we have to see a, a, a genuine um, embracement by um, politicians and officials um, to, to work differently with, with communities going forward. And that, I hope, sort of takes us wider from than, than the Smith Commission and the Smith Agreement specifically specifically to a, a different set of intentions for the way that, that we operate going forward. Peter, I think you wanted to... Yeah, just to, to follow on from the points that, that Lucy's made, I think this broader engagement that, that we've all called for and citizens-led um, approach to that engagement and using very clear tools like citizens' juries, those kinds of things, um, this isn't just about what happens up until May, up until we have an agreement or just the post... Uh, general election period when we, we might have legislation. This is about trying to change the way that we, we, we do democracy in Scotland and it's an argument that many of us have been making for a long time but I think it, it crystallised around the, the referendum where we had so much engagement. I think I would, I would particularly make a plea that um, whatever the, the processes that, that we come up with and that are agreed with um, representatives is that we we specifically look at how do we engage with disadvantaged communities because many, many communities are engaged, are represented, but those um, where that are more affected by poverty are less likely to be engaged. And I think it was, again, one of the, the things that I think all of us here uh, would have welcomed about the, the referendum was that those, those parts of Scotland that maybe have felt less involved in, in democratic politics were involved, and I think we need to maintain that, um, whatever the processes are going forward. Um, Mary has mentioned several times about the, the importance of intergovernmental arrangements, and I think that's an area that I would like to see um, ideas around where the, the engagement of civil society is in the future, that that, that, that doesn't become something that's a discussion between uh, cabinets or between um, First Minister and Prime Minister, this is, this is something that actually engages people meaningfully. And it can be done. It's, it's been done in the past and it can be done. Mary? Um, yeah, I, I, I want to make a, a pitch for housing associations as part of the solution in all of this. Uh, there isn't an area, a local authority area in Scotland that doesn't have at least one housing association. And they are membership organisations and people who want to take part in uh, not just providing housing but a raft of things around housing in areas where people um, may be suffering disadvantage uh, can take part in their local housing association. And I, I think that the, the connection between tenants who live in and use the services of housing associations and their responsibilities as committee and board members is is part, is part of the kind of uh, democratic governance opportunity that Lucy is referring to. It, um, but we don't, we don't always need to create something that, uh, from scratch because we have housing associations, for example, already. So there are models of the, of the way these things can work already. I'm going to come to that one. I'm just going to sort of act to that. I was going to say that actually I see it as the responsibility of all, all of us around the table, those at this side of the table, as well as... Um, um, 
yourselves as MSPs to look to see how we engage. I was at a Poverty Alliance AGM shortly after the referendum where this very question was asked, how do we maintain the momentum and how do we develop that more democratic governance that's so important or felt so important um, last year and remains to be. And um, there are many of us who are in civil society who, who are part of the established civil society in a way. I see ourselves in some ways as part of the establishment as well. And then there was a whole groundswell of activism and activity that took place in the lead-up to the referendum, some of whom will want to engage with the likes of us, others whom will want to create their own spaces and make their own voices heard. And I think that's the challenge in, in how do we all work with the housing associations, or whoever there is on the ground to capture those voices. And I think, I mean, there were many opportunities and many different ways that were shown to us during the referendum, depending on the community or the constituency you were trying to reach. And I suppose it's about how we create the time to be able to do so, because one of the things that any type of engagement takes is time. And one of the things that Lucy and others said earlier was part of the frustrations post-referendum with the Smith process was not having the time to be able to do that. So it's making sure that, that we are going to be building the time into what we do to enable meaningful, ongoing involvement and not just consultation. Well, listen, can I make a quick point just now, and I want then to come to Tavish. Um, the committee agreed last week as part of its work programme that we want to go to initially Hamilton, Aberdeen and, and potentially Shetland to have a long, wider discussions with communities in a focused way, but also to, as one way to describe it, town hall meetings in the evenings so that people can come and talk to us. I think it would be useful if the panel were, were prepared to do it, to come and have a cup of tea, a cup of coffee with Duncan and myself, before we go and do that, to discuss with you how best we can go about that process. It would help us be able to be, I think, be much more effective in what we do in the various communities we go around. If that's, if that's okay, and we'll try to get something sorted out in our diaries that works. Tavish. I would take him up on that. We never get a cup of coffee, so I would, uh, I, I, that's the best offer you're going to get out of a parliamentary committee these days. Um, one of the things that Lord Smith said, uh, convener, was in his own personal um, introduction and more to the point in, this, in the uh, remarks he made in the National Museum on the morning of the launch of the Smith Agreement was about devolution within Scotland. Some of you have mentioned it this morning. Um, do you agree with him? And if you do, uh, what would be your area that you'd like to see that happen in? This is, this is a, a theme that has uh, featured a lot in the discussions we've had in the third sector. And I think our view would be that um, devolution needs to go to the, to the uh, most micro level possible if you are to follow through on the overall intention of empowering people and engaging people and, and uh, building on that groundswell that, that colleagues have mentioned that came through the referendum uh, to bring about that different kind of, of democracy we were just touching on. What I worry about is that the way that the debate is, is being pursued is that uh, further devolution within Scotland tends to presume putting more powers to local authorities. I don't think that's what we're about because uh, uh, govern, government, government at local level uh, currently suffers from many of the same problems that government at, at Scottish and, and UK level does when it comes to the engagement of, of citizens uh, and the engagement of communities in what they do. Um, so I think we need to, to be, make sure that we're multidimensional when we're when discussing this issue and finding new ways to engage communities. And um, convener are absolutely <coughs> delighted to, over coffee or, or, or in whatever circumstances, to offer the advice that the voluntary organisation can give you about how you connect to people and uh, open up the conversation about the issues and policies that affect people's lives in a way that helps them, let them to connect. Specific area, policy area that you would highlight to the committee in, in the context of the theme you've just outlined? Do you mean in terms of what, what's in Smith? or Anything you care to, a policy or an area of policy that uh, should be at a local level, which is not at the moment, which is in here. I think that's a, a very sort of broad and sweeping question and probably not for today if, if, if the, the, the circumstances we're talking about is um, what was being proposed to be devolved from the UK Parliament. And I think my answer would be the same whatever area it was. Is It's not you know, from one level of government to another. It's about how each government engages with the wider community. Yeah, I think we are going to have more time over the next two years, according to a, a government minister at the UK level, um, before some of these... Uh, new powers are devolved. Um, that gives us the opportunity and 
and, and the time to really genuinely involve disabled people, for example, in co-producing a benefit, you know, a disability benefit system, carers' benefits, carers being involved as well, that genuinely supports disabled people to participate in community life, etc. So it's not about what level, it has to be all levels. Um, and, you know, and if, if we're talking about employability, for example, you could set parameters for the work programme at, at, at a Scottish Government level, but implementation is going to happen on the ground, and it's going to be need to, be, to work with local labour markets, etc. Uh, and that's where local knowledge, and again, the barriers that disabled people, for example, face in not being able to access work, physical barriers uh, and transport barriers, etc., could be addressed within you know, how uh, you implement the powers that you've got at a local level. So, um, you know, all the way through, there should be a thought of the end user of these services being involved in shaping the policies and the implementation. It's uh, a really important point that's been raised about the further devolution of powers, and it's a question of uh, the extent to which we're devolving further powers to whatever the body, whether it's local authorities or some other form, or whether it's around um, greater control or influence over implementation. I think the work programme is a, is a really interesting um, issue. I know that local, some local authorities, I think yesterday, were making the proposal that, that the work programme should go to the local authority area. And I think Bill has already made the point uh, very well that it is about um, devolving to the, to the level where, um, where it makes sense. You know, it's applying the, the principle of subsidiarity um, and, and doing things where they need best to be done. I think the, the example of the Scottish Welfare Fund is instructive um, where we've, we've given, we, Scotland has, has now given responsibility to local authorities to deliver the Scottish Welfare Fund, um, but it's within the overall context of a, of a unified system. And I think that, um, from what we hear from colleagues um, in England and Wales, is working well in Scotland compared to the situation in England and Wales. So, so I think we have some, some examples of where um, it's a question of further powers being devolved to, to local levels and whatever form that takes and where it's about the implementation. But I think the, the key point I think that, that, that Lucy's made and that I would echo is that we need to involve people in the decisions about uh, how those powers are used wherever they, wherever they lie, whether at the Scottish level or at a local level. Can I have a share, follow up there? It's helpful, thanks so very okay. much. Sir. I think Lewis had a supplementary in this area. Just, just a very brief one on, on citizen engagement. Clearly, you don't want citizen engagement to be merely a matter of constitutional uh, issues, but there is a proposal on the table uh, for a UK-wide constitutional convention, and I wonder how you would envisage Civic Scotland engaging with that, should that come into being. In terms of reference of the uh, Constitutional Convention, what it was discussing and what it wasn't before I, before I committed either way. I mean, I think obviously, I mean, w I, mean I think the, the, the important point for us is that we continue to see the devolution process in Scotland as a bilateral and not a multilateral one, i.e. we don't have to wait or take any decisions which are incumbent upon other decisions that might be taken constitutionally across the UK, even though they're important. So we'd need to see the terms of reference, I think. Yeah, because that's a general feeling. Rather than all, I, all I would say is, is that um, the committee might be, like to be aware of the fact that we have multilateral conversations all the time between different parts of civil society in the third sector. And I was uh, just before Christmas was having conversations about how further uh, developments in the UK constitution would affect civil society in different parts of or different jurisdictions. And so, if that is a general theme, we are interested. Yes, uh, and would you know undoubtedly want to to to, to follow up on the suggestion. Duncan's got a supplementary, and then I'm yeah. going to come to, I think it's Stuart, I think. It's, a, it's a, almost a rhetorical question. I, mean, I think it's for more on the panel. Uh, moving to and accepting uh, that we need to do more on engagement, and indeed, um, you know, first steps there, but um, you know, to offer that, that meeting. But I'm, I'm thinking about the challenges that, that we all need to give thought to, I suggest, and maybe we've got some initial thoughts. Is it about the capacity? And the focus 
of this Parliament that's going to change quite dramatically, given the Parliament set up to deal with limited powers. We've saw more and more powers come, and more powers still to come. So, uh, you know, I think um, there the, the, the needs to be a debate with uh, wider society, maybe I'm suggesting, I don't know if you agree, that we need to uh, uh, look at what our capacity, capacities like in the Scottish Parliament, what the Scottish Parliament committees need to do to maintain their focus and accept their responsibility for, for home governments to account and indeed the whole area of policy development, which is very important to what we get out there. I don't know whether you have any, any comments on that, but I think we all maybe need to look at that, the parliamentarians and, more importantly, the people that we purport to represent. I'll take a couple Can I have some comment? I'll, I'll nope. take a couple right. of responses, okay. and because I've still got a few folk I've got to get through. So, Peter and Mary, I think it was. I think that's, that's an important point that Duncan raises about capacity, and it's about meaningful participation, meaningful involvement. Um, I don't think any of us here would want to see um, a proliferation of, of meetings and consultations that were, were having no impact on decisions that were possibly already made. So I think that's, that's a crucial point that we need to consider as we go forward. But I don't think that should prevent us from saying we need to apply the principle that, that, that we involve um, people outside of, of elected positions in decision-making processes. And there are ways that we can do that, and capacity will always be an issue, but I think there are ways that um, the committee system could be reformed to, to try and find ways not to, to involve, we like being involved, but to involve people beyond, mm -hmm. uh, beyond those that are sitting around the table just now. So there are, there are lots, I think there are lots of ideas um, from civil society organisations and it's about trying to implement them, but we take your point about capacity. Mary, I think, I think Dave wanted to come in as well. So. Well, I, I think Peter said what I was going to say, so I'll not add to that. Okay, Dave, do you want to...? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean just very quickly, I mean, I, I, agree, I agree with the point, um, and maybe this is a, it's unusual for the trade union movement to be self-critical. Um, I think we all need to be really, really aware of the fact that we... We are civil society organisations. We do get to engage with the Parliament. But what, not just the referendum, but particularly the referendum process, I think, showed some of us is that that's not enough. It's not enough for, um, um, for I'm enjoying this very much and I'm glad to be here, but I mean, it's not, it's not enough. It's not enough for the Parliament to have a relationship with existing civil society organisations and think that it's done its job in terms of, um, uh, and that links in, I think, with the specific idea that we've raised and others about citizens, juries and otherwise of, other ways of finding um, a representative democracy that is also able to do detail, because it's the doing the detail which is very often the difficult thing. We've got the time to do that, but um, unless you've got a two-year referendum process, it's very hard for the person in the street to do that. So we need to be thinking about, you know, we need to be thinking about what are the sort of mechanisms that we can use that can supplement the consultative um, role that this, this parliament um, undertakes. Yeah, um, I think I've got two other areas to look at. Um, Stuart McMillan. Uh, no, thank you. Thank you, Vian. It's, uh, it's aimed towards uh, Dave. Uh, Dave, earlier on in your uh, comments, uh, you touched upon the, the workplace protections, uh, and also one of them is the issue of the health and safety. Uh, and uh, also within the, the, the submission, uh, the, you highlight the issue that, that, uh, that Northern Ireland already has uh, this particular uh, policy area. Uh, and so, in terms of what, what uh, any powers that could come to, to Scotland. Um, how do you see uh, certainly a Scottish Parliament of any uh, Scottish Government of any colour actually utilising that particular area to improve health and safety in Scotland? Also um, bearing in mind well, that, uh, what's already in operation. Sure. So, um, so, so you'll know that the, the, the Smith Commission recommendation is that none of the core um, health and safety powers should be um, uh, res uh, should, should be devolved, um, but that there should be some further investigation. Really, is essentially the um, uh, the, the, the clux of it um, into what we might call enforcement powers and oversight over enforcement powers, and particularly the role of the health and safety um, executive. It's not entirely clear to us um, whether that's going to be the subject of any draft clause. It certainly hasn't been the subject of any discussion thus far within the um, within the stakeholder group. So we, we're imagining that this is something that's going to be um, an ongoing discussion rather than something that you're going to see a, a clause relating to in, in, in 10 days' time. Um, 
our view isn't, as you know, our view is that a much more wholesale um, devolution should have taken place, that there's absolute sense, given that there are very particular health and safety concerns in Scotland that makes it different, given the devolution, obviously, of the whole of health, which, you know, we, we keep talking about safety is one thing, but promoting health in the workplace is, is, is just as it important. Um, that the role and the, um, and the capacity and what the HSC does in Scotland should be, number one, the subject of scrutiny by this Parliament in a situation that's potentially analogous with recommendations on the BBC and, uh, and other bodies. So a specific oversight role of the, of the role of the HSC um, uh, um, f from now on, which would allow this Parliament and allow the Scottish Government um, to begin to look at all of the uh, budgets and all of the um, uh, um, um, in engagements that it has or, you know, across a range of policy areas and look at how it best promotes health um, in the workplace. Um, um, as I say, we're disappointed that the recommendations didn't go further. It's also an area that's quite important to look at with respect to uh, Tavish Scott's question about local authority devolution, because a whole, ro uh, a whole um, uh, raft of health and safety activity is, is currently managed by local authorities, and the inspectorates there. So it would be good to be in a position to bring that together under the purview of the Scottish Parliament and to begin to be able to make some... Um, uh, some, some positive suggestions suited to Scotland's particular needs. Yeah. I mean, only Sorry. ten minutes left. I think that Dave's given us a good okay. description in that area. I've got two pe more people I need to get in before we finish here. Uh, Mark, I think you're an issue. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> just follow. Obviously, earlier on, touched on employment law. I note. Uh, and, and again, in the SDUC evidence, it says the greatest disappointment was the, the failure to propose significant devolution in the area of employment and equality law. Now, um, we've managed to achieve a 50-50 a gender balance in terms of the, the panel of witnesses today, but obviously equalities and equalities legislation goes beyond simply looking at the, the gender issue. Uh, given that equalities law is not coming to the Parliament, what or at least it's not proposed in the Smith Commission. What are the abilities that would exist to affect the kind of changes that we would want to see around equalities and the equalities agenda? Um, or is that a, a significant hamstring by not having that, that devolved? Others will probably want to talk about equalities more generally. With respect to equalities and employment law, I mean, the two had to be devolved together or not. You, know, you can't have um, an Equal Pay Act at uh, a UK level and, and, uh, and equalities devolved to Scotland. So the two, the two had to come as a suite if they were going to come. Um, I think it was disappointing that there wasn't more reference to equalities in the Smith Commission proposals, even, even, even if its ultimate conclusion was going to be for no um, significant additional devolution. You speak of what powers... So, so there's very little in the Smith Commission that changes the current situation as far as we can see. There are residual powers, obviously, with respect to um, public sector duties and the... Um, uh, uh, and, um, uh, um, the role that public sector can play as an employer in, in, in promoting in, uh, equalities. Um, but, to be honest, I can't really give you much good news in terms of our reading of what the Commission proposal said on equalities that, that make any difference to the current, the current situation. I'll come to Linda, I think. I, th I mean, I'd echo a lot of what Dave said on that. Um, for example, um, if you thought that you wanted to address labour market inequalities amongst young disabled people. Um, you might be hamstrung in, in doing that because of the Equality Act, <laughs> because it says you cannot discriminate on the basis of age. Um, and yet that might be the group that you might most want to assist um, in uh, getting into work, uh, for example. Now, a lot of it at the moment a blind eye is turned to it, as far as equality law is concerned. Um, but, in fact, you know, there, there is the potential that certain initi government initiatives could be hamstrung if a case was taken to say you can't discriminate in favour of that person, even though in doing so you're addressing a labour market inequality that you know exists. And that's why control of equality law is so important, I think, in, in addressing more generally, employability and, and, uh, and other issues, not only for disabled people, women, you know, black and minority ethnic people, younger and older uh, ends of the workforce, um, where you might see inequalities that you want to address 
and, but the Equality Act might be a barrier to, to doing so uh, rather than a, 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 an assistance in, in doing so. I'm going to go to the last question now. Linda Fabiani, you're in the yes, this is yeah, no, unusual, you're this last is... in the queue, you're getting a question in. But... <laughs> Um, just a very quick point of clarification first um, for Dave, from trade union perspective, when you were saying about having to take equality law and employment law together uh, makes sense. I wonder if the same, uh, in your opinion, applies to all elements of like workplace... Sorry. Oh, sorry. Did you hear me anyway? Yes, yes. A voice like a foghorn, so it never really matters. Um, I wonder if it also applies to general workplace protection in terms of trade unions because I'm very aware of the ongoing discussion at Westminster now about thresholds uh, for strikes. I'm, I'm also aware of the PCS current campaign because there's a consultation about taking away the right to have the union dues paid direct from wages. And I, I wonder if that's something that could be dealt with separately from the employment law, from the equalities, etc., that we've been quite clearly told will not be devolved. Um, I should say as an aside, it makes me chuckle when people talk about potential races to the bottom on employment law when, we are, when we've had the week of announcements that we've just, um, that we've just had. Um, I think the link between employment law and equality is, is, is absolute, and we couldn't have imagined the splitting of those two. And we also argued that there's a suite of essentially five powers, um, uh, including the regulation of trade unions, health and safety, and, um, and minimum wages, which really set together a, a much more coherent as a package. Could you theoretically have regulated trade unions differently in Scotland under that place, piece of law while still having reserved employment legislation? Probably. Um, could you have separated health and safety law and employment law? Probably, but it, it wouldn't have been coherent. They really, they really came together or not. Thank you, and that, that does lead into my, my substantive question, which is very much about coherence, because practically I think every one of you has expressed concerns that the package as put forward by Smith is not, in fact, coherent. Um, I know two of you are on the stakeholder group. There may be others. I'm glad these discussions are ongoing. But I just wonder how you feel about these discussions, about how we go forward. It's already been said that there's a bit of time before there's going to be any legislation. My own view is that um, we should treat the Smith Agreement as a minimum because uh, if we're truly talking about getting a degree of coherence, there may well be other things that very obviously have to come into the package. For example, uh, job creation as well as workfare, some of the other things that have been talked about through welfare and taxation. And uh, just a general feeling from the consultation discussion that's going on uh, with the Scotland office, whether you think there is room for sensible discussion uh, to improve the, the very rushed package that is, in fact, the Smith Agreement. That's a, that's a big question at the end. I, I realise that. But, um, I think probably the best way to, to deal with that is just to ask you, as, as a panel, uh, do you think there is obviously room for more discussion and uh, in terms of how we take this forward, um, perhaps you could come to us with written advice about how, where, where we need to go from now uh, and when, when the clauses arrive and how we deal with the legislation. Um, I think that's probably the best way to yeah. deal with that at this moment because I've, I've only got three minutes left in which to deal with this. Uh, and I think in, in these circumstances there will be lots of other people wanting to contribute. I think a fair question at the end would be, though, mm -hmm. in terms of the welfare powers, is it fair to say from everybody, from what we've heard, as far as the welfare powers are concerned, you'd all agree that uh, as far as that package is there, is you, uh, if I've got that right from your contributions, that everyone thinks that the, 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 the welfare should have been all devolved to the Scottish Parliament? No. Uh, am, I, am I wrong that, that? That's not the formal position of the STUC. Okay. Um, um, and that's very much linked to our view about the, um, uh, the extent to which you can have fiscal devolution. You, you, you needed much okay. fuller fiscal devolution if you were going to also have... The answer's no, so yeah, I, no. I get that. Okay. And, and just to clarify, the SFHA thought that in its submission to Smith, yeah. but we are working with the, um, the, the offer of powers that, there, that is on offer now. Right, I'm sorry, I, I probably just did the same as Linda did. I asked a too big a question at the end, so forgive me for doing that. Yeah, Listen... 
OK. You should, if if you'd come in earlier, that would been a great question for earlier. In terms of the, where we go from now, I, I look forward to having the discussion with yourselves and myself and Duncan. Um, that's the, the, we're coming to the close of the meeting now. Um, the next meeting we have next Thursday, uh, that will be the business community regarding recommendations to the Smith Commission. I now close the meeting, but can I ask members to stay behind? Because Andy, the photographer, needs to take a photograph of us as a group. But the panellists are free to go. It'll take 10 seconds. You're free to go, darling.